Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Tuesday, October 24th, 2023. Good as always to have you on board, everyone. It is a stunningly beautiful fall day here in Annapolis, one of those perfect, perfect days where there's no humidity, it's cool, it's weather is clear and visibility is a million miles, it's wonderful. So uh, with that said, uh, we've got a couple great guests in the uh, in the studio today, in the building with us, and uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Today's show is brought to you by Blue Cross Blue Shield. What makes good vision coverage? I knew it when I saw it. Things like fully covered vision care exams for all members. Access to over 125,000 independent eye care providers and national retailers. Plus benefits you can use at many online retailers. That's why I chose Blue Cross Blue Shield FVP Vision. See what we can do for you at bcbsfvpvision.com. Okay, now uh, switching to my guests today in Beach Hall with me, although they're in separate rooms for this uh, StreamYard uh, conversation, are Lieutenant J.G. Nick Romanow and Ensign Madison Sargent. They are the co-authors of the winning essay in our Diversity and Inclusion Essay Contest last year, sponsored by RTX. Their essay is titled, Cohesion is an Enduring Warfighting Advantage, and it appeared in the June 2023 issue of Proceedings. Nick Madison, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Before we get to the q and A, I I just want you to tell our listeners and viewers a little bit about yourself, starting with Nick and then with Madison. Um, where'd you go to school? What's your current command? And then uh, I, I want to hear from both of you how you teamed up for this article. So, Nick, go ahead. Yeah. Um, good afternoon, and thank you for having me on. Um, my name is Lieutenant Grade Nick Romano. I'm currently a Cryptologic Warfare Officer. I am stationed at Cryptologic Warfare Activity 67 at Fort Meade here in Maryland. Um, prior to that, I was an undergraduate student at the University of Texas at Austin, studied international relations. I was a member of the Clement Center's undergraduate uh, program in national security. And um, Madison and I, uh, kind of teamed up to combine our, our expertise. Um, I studied abroad in uh, mainland China. I studied Mandarin throughout undergrad. Um, Madison comes from more of a, uh, a Russia-focused background. And so we, we kind of combined our, our expertise on those, those two powers to um, really tease out uh, what it means to have a, a, both a diverse and inclusive force. Um, because it's one thing to be diverse, but it's a totally another thing to be inclusive. So it was, really came out well. Um, it, it was a really fun project to work on with Madison. I really learned a lot from her, and uh, I, I think it really came out to be a very cohesive piece. I agree. Okay, Madison, a little bit about you. Thank you for the invitation to come on today, Bill, and thank you for the lead, Nick. Uh, my name is Madison Sargent. I'm currently the prospective strike officer um, on board the USS Oscar Austin, so DDG-79 taking over the um, combat missiles division in December. Um, I went to Boston University where I earned my commission out of the old Ironsides Battalion from undergrad and studied international relations. And then um, I had the opportunity that the Navy uh, granted me so graciously to go uh, continue on to Columbia University to earn my master's in Russian, Eurasian, and East European studies. So like Nick said, my background is, is more Russia-based. How to show. <laughs> All right. Well, great to have you both on the show and uh, so glad that you teamed up for this one. It is a terrific article. And, uh, you know, we, we, we've had a lot of uh, diversity and inclusion uh, essays because we've run this contest now. This was the third year that we run the, ran the contest. Um, and, you know, and a lot of them very much focused on uh, how, to, how to do a better job of integrating people of different backgrounds and educations and ethnicities and uh, all that into the U.S. force, but you two took a, a, I think, and this is why it was the winning essay. You took the view of let's take a look at our our great power comp competitors. Let's look at China. Let's look at Russia, and uh, and see how they do this or don't do this, and what that means for their forces. So, uh, for our listeners who some of whom I know might be a little critical of this idea of like oh grumble grumble uh, diversity and inclusion. This article is a little different. It takes a different perspective, and and I think uh, that's why it uh, it won the uh, uh, this award or this essay contest. Um, 
So let's dig into the topic a little bit. Uh, I'll start by reading the opening paragraphs of your article. So you start with, from the deck plates to the E-ring, leaders across the Department of Defense are recognizing the need to embrace service member diversity and provide inclusive leadership to meet the demands of a peacetime force and to prepare for war. Critics argue that diversity and inclusion training and programs are dangerous distraction from the joint force's primary purpose of warfighting. DOD's DEI programs are imperfect, but this does not mean that diversity, equity, inclusion itself is misguided. Its critics often overlook the rapidly changing demographics of US society. Failing to recruit and retain a diverse force would come at the military's own peril, perhaps best exemplified by US competitors, China and Russia, which both perceive their demographic diversity as a security threat to be neutralized. Really interesting point there. While all three countries could be considered diverse, the US approach provides an opportunity the armed forces should embrace to promote cohesion and prevail in the next war. So Madison, I'll throw the first question at you. Um, how do, talk a little bit about, because you said your, your background's uh, more uh, Russia studies uh, with your master's from Columbia. Um, how, how uh, talk about Russia's diversity and how they view their ethnic minorities and, and women and how do those review? How do those views reflect in their military? Right. So um, the example that stuck out to me when we were we were doing research and writing this this essay is the the Chechen wars. And so when you had the collapse, all of this goes back several decades, right? And you had the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, and you had, had states that began breaking off from what used to be the Soviet Union. And for a point. For a period of time, there was this um, separatist movement in Chechnya, which is in the southern, it's the northern part of the Caucasus, southern, southwestern Russia. Um, and ultimately, there became this terrorism slash territorial threat from the separatists there. And it became uh, what some in political science studies that focus specifically on Russia, they call Chechnyization. And it, they, what Moscow essentially did was kill any idea, kill the entire movement and the entire idea that, that there was going to be a separate Chechen identity. And so to this day still, although that has largely been neutralized, Russia still struggles with, a, with terrorism from this region and um, with a separatist movement there. So anyone in that area, any Chechen that might see a better economic opportunity for themselves by joining the military, um, they're, they're perceived as a threat. And they don't want them to become this insider threat within the within the armed forces, which obviously is a problem because you have a lot of people who are potentially great contributors to the Russian military. They might make great soldiers. They might make great um, members of Russian society. But they're because they are perceived as this internal threat. They are not a lot a lot of that opportunity to do that. And, and across Russia, which is a vast country with a lot of different ethnic minorities. Uh, it's a problem that doesn't just uh, show itself in, in the Chechen minority, but across, right. yeah, there's a lot of Turkish Russians, there's a lot of uh, um, Aleutian sort of, uh, what we would, you know, Americans would be Alaskans up in uh, the Northeast section of Russia, which are also ethnic minorities, which are not well integrated into the, the, the greater country. Okay. Uh, that's a that's a great point. So now, uh, Nick, just talk a little bit about your studies in China, and then you know what you observe there, and how the Chinese uh, integrate or don't integrate, um, uh, you know, ethnic minorities into their military. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, I, I spent a, a short time uh, in mainland China, um, down in, a, in an interesting area of the country, down in South China, in a city called Kunming. Uh, and Kunming is a very interesting city uh, in the province of Yunnan. It's, it borders um, Vietnam and Bangladesh and those southern uh, Southeast Asian countries. So there's a, a, a big infusion of different cultures that kind of meet all in Yunnan province. Um, and so that experience really opened my eyes to, to the fact that there, there's, not, there's not one monolithic China. It's not from the, the entire China is not just all uh, the same as, as what uh, was referred to as Han Chinese, which is the, the majority ethnic group in China. And if you've been following um, the current events in China, um, not just over the last two years, but the last five years, last decade, uh, you see time and time again that the Chinese Communist Party 
um, feels very threatened by groups that do not comport with this one China, everyone's Han Chinese, everyone speaks um, the Mandarin dialect of Chinese. Um, and so you, you see that in, in 2019, that was, was actually when I was in mainland China, it was the summer of 2019, when um, the unrest in Hong Kong happened and the, and the crackdown uh, basically eliminated um, Hong Kong's previously autonomous status. Um, and of course, Hong Kong, they, they speak um, Cantonese, um, they, they had their own, their own culture, their own dialect, their own food, um, and, and that, that's been quashed. Um, you see a lot of reporting in the press of uh, the suppression of uh, Uyghur Muslim minorities in Xinjiang in Western China, um, and, and you just see a, a general hostility from the Chinese Communist Party. And the, the reason why that matters to the military is the Chinese military, the People's Liberation Army, is not the, the military of China. It's the military of the Chinese Communist Party. And so that's why you see back in 1989 that, that the tool that the Chinese Communist Party used to hold on to power against its own citizens was the PLA in, in putting down um, the student protests in Beijing in 1989 in the Tiananmen Massacre. Um, so you see a continuing trend um, from the Chinese Communist Party, from the People's Liberation Army. And so that, that, that diverts attention um, from the PLA's mission, if you believe that the PLA's mission is to, to expand out through the Western Pacific, to push out the U.S. and allied forces out of the Pacific and, and create a, a regional hegemony or a, even a global hegemony, that having to divert military resources to suppress your own minorities in your own border, um, that, that's something that does not, that does not comport with the, the grand strategic vision that the leaders of the Chinese Communist Party have for themselves. Uh, interesting points. Okay, uh, so I'll, I'll go back to um, Madison. Um, looking at the war in Ukraine, I'm not asking you to do a detailed analysis of uh, you know how that that war is going for either side, but um, do you have a perception that uh, Russia's lack of diversity in its military has manifested as uh, any kind of a liability in the war, um, and and have the mandatory conscription call-ups as they've, you know, it didn't go well in the first few months and then Moscow had to do a big reserve call-up and that sort of thing. Have those disproportionately targeted or affected any of the ethnic minorities in Russia? I think when you, I think it's a liability in terms of when you sell the idea of Russia as a state that is for, for ultimately they're Western Russians, right? The white, uh, European M Muscovites and uh, individuals from St. Petersburg, when you sell that as the, what belongs to the nation and not all of the different um, ethnic minority groups in the country, you have ultimately when you're, you're pulling people because they were losing so many bodies, they just had to pull everyone that they could um, in terms of conscription. You have people who don't believe in the ideals that they're fighting for. Um, and I think that is probably the biggest liability. Let's talk, um, I'm going to ask you a follow-on question just about uh, women in the Russian military. And I, I've, got a, I've got a couple of stories from when I was a naval attache in Russia as well uh, that I'll share because they, they shed a light on this. But when, when you uh, both wrote this, did you look at, you know, how uh, the Russians and the Chinese, how they integrate women into their officer corps, their military in general, uh, their attitudes towards women in the military? Where, how, does the, how do they compare to uh, our military? Um, I think that within, I don't think I know. So the statistics, I, and I think I pulled them from Jamestown Foundation, who does a lot of great work on, on Russia. Um, women in the military face very high levels of discrimination, uh, sexual assault, verbal abuse, all of these things that would deter women who might otherwise have an interest in the military. Uh, because that's not just an interest that American women have or Western women have in, in serving their country in this way. Um, but these are huge roadblocks for them, right? Because you, every woman, unless there's a country that requires conscription for women as well, uh, has to make a conscientious effort to to do something like join the military, right? And it's not as, as maybe second nature that comes from men because boys are grow up believing that, you know, boys become soldiers, not all of them, but it's, it's very much a path for them. Whereas women 
I believe, and I went through this, right? You had to take a little bit more time to come to the conclusion that that was the right path. So you have half of the population in Russia that it ultimately becomes a, a, a labor market issue, right? An, an issue of economics where there's a there's this artificial barrier to them joining. And, and this is the greater issue and kind of what we argue in the later paragraphs of the article. When you have these arbitrary obstacles to people uh, being willing to join the military, then you are filtering out talent. And I imagine that that is happening because of the, the way that women are treated in the military in Russia. They're not given the same opportunity to succeed. Yeah, it's a good point. I'll, I'll share my sea story. So in 2004, it was the first ever U.S.-Russia bilateral naval exercise after World War II. And the two, we had a cruiser, the USS uh, Way City, um, uh, came up from Sixth Fleet. And uh, there were two Russian um, Udaloy class destroyers that came down from the North, North Fleet from Severomorsk. And uh, I didn't, you know, I had set this all up and was emailing with the captain and crew of the of the Way City, but I'd never met the captain. I'd never, I didn't know, you know, how to what degree his crew was integrated or anything like that. Um, the Russian crew, the crews of both the Udaloy class destroyers, you know, the, the captain, the XO, and all the officers were white men. Um, that's just the way it was in the Russian Navy. And so I met them at the at the pier. The Russians first, they arrived first in, in uh, Norway. So we met in Stavanger, Norway. Uh, and then I walked up the brow of the Way City after it after it moored. Um, and we, we got up to the, you know, we came up the brow, saluted the ensign, et cetera. And the captain of the ship met us at the top of the brow. And his name was Wayne Young. And I remember he's, um, you know, he's Hollywood handsome, right? Probably six foot two, African-American, tall, thin, athletic looking, and, you know, wearing, you know, captain stripes. And, and I, you know, he's Captain Young. And, and um, I didn't know that he was African-American. The Russians, like, they were, they couldn't believe it. You know, the captain of an American cruiser was an African-American. So it took them a minute to get over being stunned. And then we met the, the, uh, the we had, there was a reception on the fantail that night. And all the officers from the two Udloys came over and all the officers from the Way City were there. And about five or six of the women of the officers on the Way City were women, including several department heads and a bunch of the of the JO uh, division officers. And so I was doing the translation and the Russian junior officers were asking me like, what's her job? And I, so I asked this one lieutenant and she said, I'm, you know, I'm the Cheng, I'm the chief engineer. And so I translated that to Russians, to Russian and they could not believe it. They're like, that's not possible. And then I asked another woman and, and it was a JG. And I said, what's your job? She said, I'm the weapons officer. And so I translated that into Russian, but they, they were stunned that we had not just women on board as like the admin officer or a translator, but women that had, you know, major jobs on board our ships. And the, and the captain of the ship was an African-American captain. Uh, and that was, you know, really eye-opening to me to see their reaction to that. And I just said, welcome to the U.S. Navy. This is, we are integrated and loud, loud and proud and strong, you know, strong. Um, and it was, you know, it was really interesting. Uh, it took a little while, but the cultural difference was, was pretty, pretty stark. Uh, I'll just say that. So, um, uh, so Nick, next question is for you. Um, so you write in the article, promoting diversity and inclusion is more than a morale building activity. It's a war, war fighting imperative. And I read, I went back uh, to your article online today and I read some of the comments from uh, some of our readers who don't agree with you. And that's fine. I think it's, you know, this is why we do the open form of proceedings and we encourage people to have a, an open and honest, uh, respectful discussion. So some of the readers are like, this is a distraction. There's no proof that diversity makes organizations more effective. So over to you, uh, first Nick, then Madison. How do you respond to that? Yeah, uh, no, thank you for the question. Um, so in, in my opinion, um, and, and speaking only for myself, um, diversity and inclusion, um, to me, that that's just leadership. So um, Madison and I, we're, we're both uh, division officers, junior officers, recently went through you know, our, our junior officer uh, training, our, our initial training pipelines, and we, we continue to, to learn how to be leaders. And, and the number one thing um, I'm told again and again and again is know your people. Like, don't just know how to how to write evals. Don't just know how to approve leave. 
but you know, know your people, know where they came came from, where were they born, where do they go to school, what are their kids' names, and so so you sit back and you, and you look at a macro view and, and you look across an entire command or an entire squadron or even an entire fleet, um, recognizing the backgrounds people come from, and recognizing that their experiences and and how they got to the navy and how their day to day lives may be different as women as mother. The, uh, someone, a service member who's a, a mother uh, has a very different experience than um, you know a, a single ensign uh, graduating just from the academy. Um, so even though though you know one team one fight and, and we're all Navy and, and we all work towards these common goals, we all bring with us uh, different experiences and different parts of our background. And so and diversity and inclusion is just one part of that, and it, and it's really no different than than just being a leader who cares about your people and wants to both anticipate, you know, what are what are the needs of my crew, what are the needs of, of the sailors in my division, but also thinking about, you know, what does my division bring to the fight? What does what does my LPO bring to the fight? What does you know my my second class, what does she bring? Um, and, and we they we all have different backgrounds. And and the great thing about the Navy is um, you know that there's no there, there's no geographic uh, bias. You know, a, a sailor in Norfolk doesn't necessarily come from Virginia or the East Coast. They come from from wherever. And so the, the need to not just recognize diversity, like we're, we're a diverse force. That's just kind of a fact. That's just, you know, looking across the deck plate, making an observation. But inclusion is about the act we take and, and the approach we take to try to leverage the tools the experiences that our sailors have, that our teams have, and, and work towards the mission. Yeah, well put. I don't think I could have said that when I was an ensign, but I, I agree with the, the sentiment for certain. Uh, Madison, your, your take on that. So there's a, a couple points I can make um, to, to sell our argument, right? And so there are people who, who are no longer in the Navy, or maybe they weren't in the Navy ever, but they are rightfully a concerned citizen of their keeping up with military affairs and that's they have the full right if not the obligation to do that as a as a responsible citizen i think what some of the people who are very have very harsh criticisms for the military's efforts to um include people of all different backgrounds is that they believe that these conversations are happening in between the deck plates right every day and so uh it's it's almost a joke between me and other JOs where, you know, there's, we get on Twitter and that's where a lot of these people are getting their information. We see people losing their minds about, oh, diversity and, uh, diversity and inclusion is destroying our military. And it just is a, it's taking up all of our time all day long when we could be PTing or war fighting or what have you. And it's hilarious to us because all of our time is taking is taken up doing CAS reps and working on calls, you know, not thinking about these very uh, ultimately like very online aspects of of DNI and what people think it is or DENI. Um, I like everything that Nick said. It, it's very like a normative based and and right. And the ideals of the United States translates to having a military that that embraces our differences and in, in all of our backgrounds. But there's also a very solid and hard to ignore economic argument for diversity and inclusion. And it's that the United States does not have conscription because we're not in an open, like a declared conflict right now. We're a volunteer force. And therefore it is on the military to sell itself to Americans of all backgrounds. And that doesn't have to, that doesn't mean, you know, permitting people that, that don't hit the wickets for military service. But it does mean letting everyone know that it's an op it is an option for them and that they would be welcomed here if they're willing to fight for their country. And everyone that joins the military made that decision at some point, right? Um, conscription. If we went into an open conflict, this would this would be a different conversation, right? But right now, conscription is not politically feasible, and the military is facing, particularly the Navy. And then in, in for SWOs, like very much so, they're facing serious issues with um, recruiting, but even worse issues with retention. And so if you create an environment that's hostile to people who want to do good and want to serve their country and they're willing to work for that based off of their skin color or their sex or their sexual orientation, uh, you're not helping yourself at all. Um, and that I believe is the more pressing concern for 
military leadership than what someone who, you know, probably needs to like put down the phone and go outside, you know, or go, or go take a tour of a U.S. warship. Cause every time we pull in for fleet week or, you know, I'm, we went up to Eastport, Maine just for 4th of July and we, we had maybe 3000 people come on board. 1200 people live in that town and we had, we give 3000 tours. So uh, and one of the comments that some of the the locals had was, "Wow, y'all are like so diverse. Diverse, excuse me. It's like very surprising because it's not a very diverse town." Um, I think also, oh, this this thought might have just left my mind, so maybe not. That's okay. Think think of that because yeah. I want to. <laughs> yeah, I want no. I wanted to throw um, a, a couple of thoughts uh, at you or with you um, that, that that highlight what you just said because. Uh, last week, I had Lieutenant Commander Andrea Howard, Lieutenant Commander Emma McCarthy on the show, and the timing of these two shows is completely coincidental, you know, um, uh, but but they were on talking about their October article about, uh, it was called Separate. Separate but Equal. Yes, yeah, Separate but Equal, sorry, yes. Um, they are two of the first hundred women submarine officers in the U.S. Navy, and they have lessons from how women were integrated into submarines, right? And they were both, you know, Emma was the first woman on her crew on an SSGN, so blue gold crew, and her crew had the, um, um, uh, she was the first woman in, in that crew on the USS Ohio. Sorry, Heather corrects me, different but equal, not separate but equal, different but equal is the name of the uh, the article. Um, and, and they, you know, made the point that, hey, you know, we, we wrote this article and it's got ideas about, you know, some lessons we learned and, and there's more submarines to come that will be integrated and how to do that well. But I, Andrea sort of slipped in this point that this is a 1% conversation, meaning 99 point something percent of the time they're focused on running the nuclear power plant, getting qualified, making sure that corrosion is taken care of, getting the ship out of the shipyards. Um, you know, going through the trainers and getting, you know, all of their warfighting training and, you know, standing watches and doing all the stuff that submariners do. And, oh, by the way, there's one person at a time. You kind of have to think about these things. Like, how do you communicate with people? What, what's the impact of language? What are, you know, how do you do zone inspections when you got men and women? Uh, you know, where does the responsibility lie in terms of the chief's mess versus the officer's mess? But she said that, you know, it's, this is 1% of what we're thinking about. It's not you know, it's not 70, 80, 90 percent of the time. So uh, when you mentioned your, what your comments there, it just resonated with me that, oh, yeah, I heard that from Andrea, Lieutenant Commander and Emma as well, that this is not the main focus of the military today. It is it is a an important thing to talk about. But we've got to get it right. To your point, you know, all the services are facing um, problems with recruiting. Um, the Navy, the Marine, sorry, the Navy, the Army, and the Air Force all missed their goals for FY 2023, which just ended a few weeks ago. The Marine Corps met its goals, but kind of close, right? And then there's the retention part of it, and you know, the surface warfare community, the submarine community, a lot of these communities are not, and the naval aviation not meeting their retention goals. So, you, you gotta, you you, you need a, a diverse force, and you gotta make them stay. You gotta make them comfortable and make them feel like. They're part of a whole, and and they want to stay. Anyway, I'm editorializing way too much for the to be the host of the show. But um, let me go. Um, there's another argument that I wanted also picked up in the uh, some of the online comments, and I've heard it from other comments in uh, about articles that we've published on this topic, um, and that and that's this one. Um, and the, the 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 comment is the military, the U.S. military is already integrated. Uh, even folks who were like me, Cold War warriors, you know, you know, commissioned back in the 80s, it, you know, it was integrated then. It's it was a meritocracy then. There were women, there were minorities in every branch at every rank. So why are we still talking about this? And and so I throw out to you, you know, why and also what more should the military be doing? Uh, maybe Nick, you tackle that one first. Yeah, I mean, I think um, you know, it, it's a good point, and I and I think it. If anything, um, I, I think that point only strengthens our argument that that you know thinking about diversity and inclusion now it's not a diversion from our history. You know, it's part of our history. Um, you know, I was I just had my, my promotion ceremony to uh, lieutenant junior grade this past weekend. Uh, Congratulations! Down, down on the, thank you. Uh, down on the National Mall with my parents, and uh, before that, um, we went into the the new um, National Museum of African American History. It's, it's like five years old, but but relatively new for a Smithsonian Museum. And what really struck out to me with walking through there 
um, was the contributions that African American um, soldiers made in the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, and World War II um, that that they made despite the fact that they were facing discrimination in their day to day lives outside of of war fighting. And so I, I think about that. That's part of our heritage, and and the Navy is a very heritage focused uh, organization. It's it, it's part of that's part of the reason. Going back to to talking about retention, um, that's part of the reason why you know someone might choose to stay in the Navy versus leave and and, and try to make more money for their families in the in the private sectors because it's to be a part of something bigger than yourself, and and, and that that institution. Um, it needs to to integrate um, not just the people who are who are currently in it, but also recognize um, our our heritage and, and the people who, um, in the past, their service was taken for granted, and or their service was not fully appreciated. And, and I think it's important for leaders to to look back and say, no, like what what different groups of people did in the past was maybe not recognized properly at the time, but it continues to be a beacon today uh, of the, 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 the courage, the dedication that, that we should aspire to as current service members. Um, so so I, I don't really see it as a, as a counter argument. I see it as a, uh, as, as a reason why, um, you know, a reason why to embrace it because it, it's part of like the Navy is a human organization. It's, yes, it consists of ships and aircraft and subs, but it, it Consists of sailors, and and, and um, uh, there'd be no the ships would not be getting underway without without people to to get them underway. So um, I, I really view that 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 history as, as important to um, keep keep thinking about and, and keep using as a tool for leaders to to motivate their sailors to be the best they can be. Okay, good point, uh, Madison. Anything to to add to that one? Yeah, um, you know it's interesting that they. They rightfully point out that there have always been women and, and ethnic minorities that have served in the military, and that's that's true. But we're not fully integrated today, and that is one of the reasons why there's still a conversation happening, right? So previously, before women were allowed, what is it, 2011 or 2013 was when all combat roles opened up for women. And before that, it, I mean, I had a friend in a ROTC with me back in Boston, and his mom, she served in the Navy for a long time. She's still in the Navy today. Um, I don't know her rank, so I'm, I'm sorry if she hears this and remembers this conversation. But she uh, commissioned as an intelligence officer, if I'm remembering correctly, because she wasn't allowed to, to become a SWO. She wasn't allowed to go serve on a, on a surface ship because it was seen as too dangerous for women. Um, so I think, you know, yes, we have, there has been a lot done. And in a lot of ways, the military, it, it's interesting, this, this, uh, like sound by I hear a lot that the, there's no place for social experiments in the military because if you read something like um, the the professional soldier which is by uh, Yankovic if I'm remembering correctly um, it's this this book about how the military while it is by nature a conservative um, organization in that it it moves very slowly to adapt change there's been these pushes always for um, for these little social experiments, if you will, out of out of military necessity, right? So in allowing women to join because we wouldn't be able to have a, a volunteer force if women weren't allowed to serve in the military. We wouldn't have enough bodies um, for that, uh, allowing African-Americans to serve, right? So that has always, these um, logistical necessities have pushed the military to kind of be these forerunners before, before it was cool, right? Before everyone else was doing uh, focusing on diversity and inclusion and, and finding ways to um, to keep people in. That's a good point. Um, yeah, and, and and often those social experiments, if you will, in you know air quotes, uh, were driven by national leaders, right? It was they were decisions made by Congress, decisions made by President Harry Truman, nineteen forty eight, uh, you know, to integrate the force, et cetera, right? Um, so. Uh, a, a lot of this is or uh, decisions made by the, the nation and by our political leaders. Um, so uh, let me just ask you, uh, we're, we're running short on time here, so we have maybe four or five minutes left, but uh, I got two two questions and you just answer these quick ones quickly. Um, what advice do you have for CEOs or senior enlisted leaders, or maybe even for, to be so bold, the CNO or this, the Commandant of the Marine Corps on 
you know, what more can be done? How, what are some, some ways when, when you're talking with your fellow JOs, you think, hey, you know, we're doing this, but maybe we can do this. What, what are some ways that we could do this even, you know, to a greater extent? Maybe Nick, go first. Yeah, I, I can take an initial stab. Uh, one thing I think about a lot, and, and I think I, I, I kind of alluded to it in, in my first answer to your first question, um, is, you know, I, I think leaders, especially public-facing leaders, um, like admirals and, and the CNO and the commandant, um, I think we should diversify what diversity means. Um, so, so, you know, we think of diversity inclusion of like race, gender, sexual orientation, these kind of classes. Um, I think, you know, if we, if we broaden what diversity is even further, just think about, you know, on my, on, on a ship, on a, at a command, how many states are represented at this command? And, you know, I, it, it'll probably be well over 50% of states. I, I, I'd be curious, I would be really curious to know, you know, what's the average number of, of, of um, uh, states represented on board a, a DEG? Um, and and there, there's all kinds of things, you know, where you went to school, um, you know, what kind of family you came from, um, even, even things like um, uh, heritage, like, you know, Irish, how many Irish Americans and, and how does that affect, you know, people who, who decide to serve and, and, and things like that. Um, I, so I, I think that, that that's one way that I think um, you can kind of make a stronger case uh, to the public of, of, you know, diversity and inclusion. It's not just a social experiment, but it, it's, it's just the basis of leading a all-volunteer force derived from a, a multinational, multi-ethnic uh, democracy. And, um, you know, if you want to, as Madison said earlier, if you want to maintain a volunteer force in a diverse country, you need to make sure that you're practicing uh, inclusion in the, in the ways you recruit, the ways you train, and the ways you retain. Madison? Uh, so my, my offering is going to be very tangible and not directly related to anything in our article, but uh, to use the Navy's own words, I would get real, get better about people's family situations and the obligations that they have to their to their families at home. And so, of course, when you're underway or deployed, that the mission is going to come first always. But, you know, being cognizant and, and not letting this trickle down from from the top of a command to department heads, to divos, to chiefs, where we're not being smart with people's time and and making excuses for or treating everything like an, an emergency, if you will, when someone needs to go pick up their kids from school mm -hmm. or, or they have this obligation to their spouse or, you know, what have you. Um, it seems like from, and this is anecdotal, although there are tons of surveys out there, right? The Navy keeps doing surveys. They don't like the ant They don't like the results. So they put out a different survey. And lots um, of proceedings articles to this point as well. Yes. Uh, a lot, keep, they, the Navy cannot keep people because they do not allow them the the time that they need with with their families um, to just to, to just be a present a mother a present father uh, like a a good spouse any of those things um, and I, I've seen that I, I've I haven't been in the navy that long and I've seen careers already die because of this you know because the in a non emergency non wartime environment we're asking people to choose between their homes and and the navy and they're going to choose their they're just going to choose their family. You know, nine times out of time, nine times out of ten, um, we shouldn't put them in that position unless we have to. Yeah, uh, that's. Uh, I think you're making a good point, and it, it it echoes what we've heard from a number of other folks about sort of the work life balance, particularly when, you know, everyone gets, uh, uh, you know, that when you're underway and you're on deployment, it, that it's a hundred percent, it's work, it's work, work, you know, um, but when you're back home. Mm -hmm. Uh, we got to figure out how to make maintenance better. We got to figure out how to balance people's lives a little bit better. Uh, that, that, yeah, that's a point. You're making a point that we hear from a lot of folks. Um, so uh, last question. This is a, just a quick gut check question, and it almost it's almost a you know shots fired or you know saved rounds or um, what's the mood of Jopa these days? Like, wh what are you hearing on your ship or at your unit up at uh, up at NSA, Nick? Uh, when you talk to fellow, you know, ensigns, JGs, lieutenants, um, you know, how are they feeling about 
being in the Navy these days? Um, you know, that that's a really good question. Um, I think junior officers, um, you know, we, we join and, and, and we're at the in an interesting position that we're simultaneously trying to trying to learn the job and do the job. And I think that that creates a lot of stress. Um, I think full processes um, in, in every community um, are, are very uh, rigorous for good reason. Um, and and uh, but overall, I think you know Jopa morale is is high. Um, I do think that that there's uncertainty um, among junior officers of what the next five years will look like. There's a lot of senior leaders um, um, expecting uh, maybe a conflict, um, maybe something else. Um, I think that there's a lot of uncertainty uh, among junior officers of, of both how to kind of prepare ourselves for that and our families for that, but also how to how do we speak to our, our sailors about that? Because because it, it's one thing uh, um, to, to read an op-ed and, and and repeat the the talking points from the op-ed or repeat what you hear on, on cable news. It's another thing to to you know sit down uh, with your sailors and, and have a conversation of, of you know oh what did this what does this admiral mean? What did this general mean uh, when they said this or that about about um, the Indo-Pacific and, and um, uh, probability of conflict. So I, I think there, there, there's good and bad. Um, uh, everyone has a unique experience um, uh, across junior officers, across communities. Um, um, and so I, I think that there's uh, definitely, definitely lots of different opinions on this. I'd be interested what, what Madison uh, is hearing on okay. her ship. Madison, take it, take it home for us. Well, we're still laughing, so that's uh, that matters. Um, I think people are tired. I think people don't, they're not signing for department head. Um, they're coming at the end of their, they're either burning out in their first tour or coming, definitely coming out of their second tour burnt out. Um, so it, we have fun. Like we laugh a lot. We laugh until we cry. That's probably the lack of sleep on crew days for us. Uh, but I think generally, it, and it's not even like, they don't like the military or they don't like what they do it's the scheduling and that um will probably be my next article for proceedings so we'll see i'll keep it short and uh leave something to be desired well i i would point out in fact i should connect you with him so you're on the uss oscar austin and one of our most prolific authors is a guy named john cordell retired mm -hmm. navy yeah. captain that john commanded the oscar austin and he's written a lot about sleep and sleep deprivation and um, different watch schedules that can be used to improve the sleep. Uh, in fact, he's done a lot of work with uh, the Naval Postgraduate School and sleep studies and that sort of thing. So he he and you should partner up. And he's just a great guy. He's a great mentor. Uh, lives in, you know in the Norfolk area. So I, I'll connect you with him because uh, John is one of my favorite people, one of my favorite proceedings authors. And so I always like to connect you know young folks with uh, with John. So. All right, well, uh, my guests today have been uh, Navy Lieutenant J.G. Nick Romanow and Ensign Madison Sergeant. Their article, Cohesion is an Enduring Warfighting Advantage, is in the June issue of Proceedings. Nick Madison, uh, thanks for writing for us and thanks for being here today. Of course, thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks so much. All right, well, uh, this episode was brought to you by Blue Cross Blue Shield. What makes good vision coverage? I knew it when I saw it. Things like fully covered vision care exams for all members. Access to over 125,000 independent eye care providers and national retailers. Plus benefits you can use at many online retailers. That's why I chose Blue Cross Blue Shield FEP Vision. See what we can do for you at bcbsfepvision.com. And until next week, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.